Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless your name for this wonderful time in your presence. We acknowledge your mighty hand that is upon us. We give you glory and praise for this opportunity to learn your word. The entrance of your word brings light and understanding to our hearts. We ask, Father God, that even as we delve into your word, you will cause us to experience phenomenal transformation to the glory of your name alone. We ask, Lord, that our lives will experience advancement and your kingdom will move forward, even through our lives and through our hands. May your name alone be glorified, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much for today. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you something very, very powerful that is going to change your lives. I'd like you to pay very, very close attention. Um, the Word of God has the power to renew minds and to transform lives. The entrance, the Bible says, brings light. It also brings understanding. I want you to know as the light begins to flood your heart today, you begin to experience help with applying these truths in various aspects of your lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'm going to be sharing with us today on the structure and the flow. The structure and the flow. I'd like you to know that this message is applicable in every area of your life. I'd like you to pay attention to every truth that will be shared as these truths are kingdom truths. They are truths that are not only applicable for success, they are applicable for sustenance of the success that you come into. I'll be starting and sharing a text from Psalm 102 verse 16. Psalm 102 verse 16. It says, For the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in the, his glory. A version says, When the Lord has built up Zion, then shall he appear in his glory. When the Lord has built up Zion, then shall he appear in his glory. I'd like you to know that the building of Zion is a prerequisite to the appearance of the Lord. Because the Lord, the Lord's visitation can come and go without the effects being sustained in our lives. And therefore, it's very important, according to this scripture and in other scriptures that you'll be seeing shortly, that there is a structure built around the visitation of the Lord so that that visitation can be sustained. I'm sure you've seen this scripture before in Genesis 2 verse 5, where it says, up until then, the Lord had not caused the rain to fall because there was no man to till the ground. So it's important that there is a man who is that structure that can retain that shower, that rain of the Lord, that can preserve that rain of the Lord, and that can appropriately, appropriately channel that rain into different aspects for use, for productivity, for fruitfulness. So that when that rain comes, it's not a waste. And this is a principle that you will see all through scripture. Structure is first built before there is a downpour. When that structure is set in place, then that downpour can be appropriately used. You will notice in the construction of a house, there is first piping. Piping is done in different areas. Either piping for electrical cables or piping for the flow of water. It's first done before you now unleash the tap or unleash, you know, the, the, the well or whatever um, water body has been connected to the house to sustain that house. So when that piping is properly done and then you release or unleash the tap and the water begins to flow, then that water is guided through the piping structure that has been put in place. And then the water that flows is able to benefit those that are working in the kitchen, those that are working or those that are maybe having a shower in the bathroom and those that are making use of the water in other aspects of the home or of the house. So it's important that structures are properly set in place so that when there is a release of that flow, which can be, you know, typified in different things. It can be typified in an outpouring of the spirit. 
can be typified in an outpouring of the glory of God or the visitation of the Lord. So it's important that the visitation of God is captured in what we call structure. And when it's only when that structure is set in place that such a visitation, such an outpouring can be retained, can be sustained, and can become something consolidated for future usage. Hallelujah. I'd like you to also know from 1 Kings 9, Solomon experienced a visitation of the Lord from verse 1. 1 Kings 9, from verse 1. But there was a prerequisite to it, which underscores what I'm talking about. 1 Kings 9, from verse 1. 1 Kings 9, from verse 1. I like to read all the way. 1 Kings 9, 1 Kings 9, from verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 9, from verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 9 from verse 1. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's just be patient a little bit for the media to help out. It's chapter 9 verse 1. That was the story of the Lord's appearance after Solomon was through building the temple. The Bible says, after Solomon completed the building of the house, it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord that the, and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, the next verse, the next verse, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. So you realize the appearance of the Lord at Gibeon in 1 Kings chapter 3 was after Solomon had set up an altar and offered up a thousand burnt offerings unto the Lord. That was a kind of structure. He set up a structure where his offering to the Lord was concerned. And the Lord showed up, you know, by a visitation. Now, this was another structure. Solomon had built an house, I mean, a house for the Lord, and also built his own house. And the Lord appeared to him that same night, the way the Lord did in chapter 3. And then the Lord began to make commitments. Next verse, please, verse 3. I want you to see this so we can learn this. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house. Now, this was the, Lord, the Lord's commitment, the Lord's response to the structure that Solomon had set up. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Speaking about God's response, God's answer to their prayers. Then after the Lord gave his commitment to this structure that Solomon had set around the worship of God in the house of the Lord, the Lord was now giving Solomon a counsel for him to set structure in his own life. He had set structure for the house of the Lord and God responded to that structure. And let me tell you something, soon as you begin to set structures in place in various aspects of your life, you will see the Lord's response. Now, this matter of structure cuts across different facets of our endeavor. It has to do with things pertaining to your life as a person, things pertaining to your lifestyle, things pertaining to your family, things pertaining to your organization, your business, your career, things pertaining to even your city and even your nation. You can set structures in these different faces, these different areas, and you begin to see God respond to you with the flow. Now look at what the Lord begins to say to him in verse 4. Now if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and my judgment. This was the Lord telling him, if you can set structure in your own life to put in place disciplines, to put in place, you know, necessary, uh, regular seeking of the Lord, in obedience to the word of God, obedience to the statutes of God, and you begin to practice the things that you have learned from my commandments and from my law, and you begin to live your life like David, your father, did, observing the same covenants that David observed when he was walking with me. Look at what the Lord says. Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David. So there were responses that, you know, accrued to structures around the house of the Lord. Which differed from responses that accrued to structures around your personal life. And the Lord was letting Solomon know that there are, these are two different things. Concerning the house of the Lord, my name will be there forever. 
my heart will be there. My eyes will be there. My presence will be there. And I will listen to every prayer offered there. But concerning your own life, there are prerequisites to you experiencing my manifest presence in your own life. And for it to be sustained forever. You know, we are in a generation where people would rather have it light and loose than have it structured with a commitment. People don't want to engage in, you know, strong, solid commitments. People's words are no longer their bonds. People want to say something and they want to be able to turn around and, you know, twist everything. They don't want to commit to writing, signing documents and staying true to those words and to those letters that they've noted. We're in a generation where people will, you know, rather just have things loose, not tied, not, you know, properly set in place. But as believers, we need to stand out as lights in this generation. It's called the jet age. It's called the fast-paced age. It's called that age where, you know, cars, there are a lot of cars that are not so solid, a lot of furniture that are not made from solid wood, a lot of things are just plastic. You know, we're in a generation where people do not, do the, no longer set priorities where the kingdom of God is concerned. They will treat things that have to do with the Lord later in the sweet by and by. But as believers, God is calling you and I to set in place structures in our lives. Structures that can now sustain the visitation of the Lord. Sustain the results that we are producing. Sustain the outpouring of God's spirit. The rain did not fall, the Bible says in Genesis, because there was no man to till the ground. Could it be that there are some of us that need to put in place, submitting to the Lord, new wine skins. We've been crying for new wine, but we've not set in place new wine skins. Until those wine skins are set in place, the Lord will not send new wine because it's going to waste, like the Bible says, if it comes into the old wine skin. Because the old wine skin will still expand by virtue of this new wine and it will rent, it will burst and the wine will be wasted and the wine skin as well will also be done away with. God is calling you and I to a life of commitment to his word. A life that is structured around his will. I'm sure you've read before Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 all the way from verse 1. When the spirit of God took Ezekiel into the valley of dry bones. And as he saw the valley of dry bones, the Lord said to him, Son of man, can these bones live? And the conversation went on and on. And the Lord brought him to a place where the Lord said to him, Speak now, command. And as Ezekiel began to make the commands according to the word of the Lord, the Bible says a wind caused bones to come together with bones. Until the bones were formed, the sinews, the flesh could not come together. The bones formed where, you know, I mean, describe the, describe the structure that needed to be in place so that the flesh, the sinews, can rest upon this skeletal structure of the bones. And then it became a, an exceeding great army when the breath of God came upon it. I want you to know, a structure has to be set in place first before you can have beauty and aesthetics around it. You know, many times people would rather go the way of, you know, putting up something that is frothy but frivolous. Something that is, you know, attractive but lacking value. That is superficial. People would rather have things that are exciting. Very exciting, very beautiful to behold but lacking sustaining power. But I want you to know, the Lord is calling us. To set in place structures so that when the beauty, the glory of God comes to rest upon it, it can have a place to rest. Like a friend of mine will say, the dove needs to find a place to rest. When Jesus was being baptized, the Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him in the semblance of a dove. And when the Spirit came and alighted upon the Lord, the Spirit rested, the dove rested. You need to allow the dove, the power, the glory, the, the, the hand of the Lord rest upon your life. When you set in place that structure that can contain that visitation of the Lord. Can somebody say amen? At this juncture, I would like, I would like someone to just bow their heads and begin to talk to the Lord. 
Begin to talk to the Lord, even as we take it deeper today. Begin to talk to the Lord. Lord, every area of my life is lacking structure. Every area that I have, just aesthetics that is lacking lasting structure. Lord, grant me the wisdom to be able to apply these truths to those areas. Somebody is talking to the Lord at this moment. Talk to the Lord. Grant me wisdom and the courage to face up to areas that have been loose, areas that have been light, to be able to put in place lasting structure, lasting templates, lasting disciplines that can retain your visitation and that can retain your power. And areas that I need to set in place consecration so that I can retain your visitation. Lord, grant me illumination in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. As we take it further, I'd like to just give a definition to structure. Just to give a definition to structure. Structure is, you know, structure is that concise understanding of the relationship that exists between the components of a process and the proper arrangement of different parts of a system. The concise understanding of the relationships that exist among components of a, of a process and the proper arrangement of the various parts of a system. Now, when you, when you put in place this arrangement and this, the arrangement is properly done, then you are able to prioritize. Your prioritization will now help you in putting in place orderliness, and when there is orderliness, you are able to replicate results and you are also able to have consistency in the kinds of results that you are producing. You need to have an understanding of the workings, the relationships that exist around the components of a process and put in place proper arrangements of the different parts of the system. And then by so doing, you are able to get proper prioritization and orderliness which produces consistency in your results. This consistency is very critical. You will see this in creation. Very apparent in creation. The elements of the skies, the sun, the moon, the stars. God set in place structures that bring up the sun. Structures that cause the sun to set structures that usher us into a new season, maybe raining season, or maybe the dry season, or maybe the fall, or the winter, or the spring, or the summer. Structures are set in place in the heavenlies. Structures around rotation of the earth, revolution of the earth. Structures are set in place by the almighty God. And by virtue of these structures, we have rain falling in its own season. Look at the scripture in Leviticus 26 verse 4. Leviticus 26 verse 4. You know, it's a scripture that talks about how that the Lord will give rain in his season. And give fruit, cause fruit and vegetation to come up at their own time. These things are set in place by the Lord to enhance a, 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 a living that people... People, people, you know, are able to predict what happens per time. And people plan with the way things have been set by the Lord. People plan with it. Farmers are ready to sow once it's raining season. And you know, everything just runs on rails. We can even have weather forecasts to be able to know when, you know, we will have certain kinds of weather, certain kinds of climate because of the predictability of the elements that the Lord has set in place in the heavenlies. And the Lord is showing us by these examples that we can, you know, factor into our own day-to-day -day living. Factor into our own choices. Factor into our own disciplines. I also like you to see this, this, this powerful scripture in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 40. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 40. It says, let everything be done decently and in order. Let everything be done decently and in order. You can come to a point by studying and understanding the events of things around you. You are able to factor and create a system that works for different areas of your life. 
a discipline that works for different aspects of your existence. Whether it is your workplace, or it is your business, or it is your family, or it is your personal well-being. You begin to create those systems around your understanding of the way things work, both in that external environment and also within your own personal life. Like I said earlier on, structures can be put in place around your life. It can be put in place to help with your lifestyle. It can be put in place in your business, in your organization, in your family. Just to look at a few scriptures that can help us today. A few scriptures that can help us, you know, where the structure around your life is concerned. There is this very powerful scripture in Proverbs 25 verse 28. Proverbs 25 verse 28. It says, a man who lacks discipline, is, who lacks self-control or discipline, is like a city without walls. A man who lacks self-control, a man who lacks discipline, is like a city without walls. A city without walls is a city that is endangered. A city where anything and everything goes. A city where things can just barge in into the city unannounced because there are no walls to be able to screen what comes into the city. Is your life like becoming like that? You may need to put in place disciplines and self-control. The Bible says a man having no self-control is like a city without walls. A city without walls. A city where anything goes, everything can come in without being screened. Hallelujah. The Bible also says in Proverbs 23 verse 2, still, you know, where it has to do with your personal life. The Bible says to put a knife to your throat. By so saying, the Bible was trying to communicate the need to master your appetite. The need to master your taste buds. Everything is not meant for eating. Sometimes it's important in relation to where structure is concerned to discipline yourself to embark on a fast. To discipline yourself to skip meals so as to be able to pray. Some other times, not even necessarily because you want to pray, but just to be able to set in place these disciplines to master your, your, your appetite. Your ability to master your appetite where food is concerned also spills over, spills over to mastering your appetite where sleep is concerned, where sexual desires are concerned as well. When you are able to master your appetite for food and for water, you will be able to strengthen your resolve to master your appetite where sleep is concerned. You're able to stay awake in the night to pray and to seek the face of God. You're able to retain and withhold yourself from any urge for sexual appetite or urges or inordinate affection that the enemy seeks to throw on you. These disciplines are very necessary. I can't forget the very popular quote, pay now and play later. Or play now and pay later. You either pay now and play later or play now and pay later. If you are able to pay now, then guaranteed you will be able to play. Which entails enjoying and reaping the benefits of the discipline that you have set in place in the now. Let's also observe some more scriptures. Some more scriptures where... Um, our lifestyle is concerned. And I want you to know that successful people do daily what unsuccessful or what failures do once in a while. What does this tell you? People that are termed as unsuccessful or people that are, are termed as failures, they actually also do the same things that successful people do, only that it has not become a habit. Let me just, let me just bring forth this quote by a very, very famous man of God. It says, nothing will ever dominate your life unless it happens daily. Until you allow a successful habit become a daily routine, it will not dominate your life. So successful people do daily, regularly. They've been able to put in place a structure that helps them to live their lives in a certain way. They are saving habits. They are spending habits. Their, their, their ability to curtail impulse purchasing are the things that help them to be able to save up and to be able to make wise investments. 
They are not in a hurry to make investments. They investigate before they make investments. And that's a law where investment is concerned. You need to investigate before you invest. If you don't, you know, take your time to carry out proper investigation, you can find yourself throwing your money away in the name of investment. In the name of investment. The scripture also gives us counsel where our work is concerned. Proverbs 24 verse 27 is a very powerful scripture. Proverbs 24 verse 27. Proverbs 24 verse 27. I'd like us to read this. It says, prepare your work outside or your outside work. Make it fit for yourself in the field and afterward build your house. The Bible is saying to us, set in place a business system that helps you to be able to get profit or what is called passive income. And from that income that comes in, you can now begin to flow that into building your house. Don't build your house first when there is no business that recycles and replenishes your means of livelihood. The Bible, you know, even goes into details where the matters of our economy is concerned. And this has to do with structure. Set in place a structure in your business that recycles your products, that replenishes your profits, that, you know, keeps funds flowing, that keeps a, a, a very fluid cash flow. And then from that flow of funds, you can now channel it into building your house. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we've seen in different areas of our lives how structure is very important. How structure is very, very important. In producing consistent and continuous results, you need structure. The Bible says, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross and despised the shame. Are there goals that you have set in, you know, ahead of you in this year? Are there goals for this quarter? Are there goals for this half year? Are there goals for this month? And, you know, you've set such goals time and again, and you've not been able to achieve those goals. It's time to set in place proper structures and discipline yourself to align with those structures so that those structures on their own can now begin to produce the results you so desire. Until structures are set in place, a person's life is at the mercy of just waiting for inspiration. But you know what? Inspiration comes to spice up our lives. But we need to have disciplines for studying the word. Disciplines for our prayer lives. Disciplines for our love life with our spouses. Disciplines on how to raise up our children. Disciplines on how to run our business. Disciplines where ministry is concerned. It's those disciplines that can now make for consistency of results. That can make for consistency of productivity. Can somebody say amen? Praise the Lord. With this knowledge coming to you, I'd like you to begin to look at those areas of your life where you've had temporary results or where you've had one-off results or where you just, you know, came into what you call a breakthrough. You just broke through. But that breakthrough since the last one you had, which was maybe like a year or two ago, you've not had another one. You need to ask the Lord and cry to the Lord for strategies and wisdom on how to build structure around that result that you stumbled into so that that result can become the order of the day in your life. Somebody says, I remember back in the years, I prayed up a storm five hours straight. Seven hours straight, but now it's so difficult to even pray an hour. There was a structure that enabled that back then. If you create that same atmosphere around you, that same structure around you, you find yourself producing the same result. And if you do it repeatedly and in a disciplined approach, you realize that that will become your natural habitat. You begin to live like that. Your prayer life will go to another level. Your ministry will begin to experience phenomenal, consistent result. Not only ministry, even your work, even your business will begin to feel this pump of God's power, of God's energy that produces continuous results. Did you know that even the way the Lord created and structured the human being is with systems. The human being is... A comp a, 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 a comprises different systems. The circulatory system. The digestive system. The respiratory system. 
the excretion system, the absorption system, different systems in the human body. Looking at the circulatory system, there is a way the heart is structured and it is the structure of the heart that enables this, you know, this organ called the heart to be able to function to sustaining the body. There is, there is the upper chamber of the heart that is divided into two, the left and the right atrium. There is the lower chamber of the heart called the ventricle, the left and the right ventricles. The atrium pumps into the lower chamber, the ventricles. And then from the ventricles, you have blood being pumped out through an artery called the aorta. It pumps out blood into the system. And then you have a vein called the vena cava, bringing in blood back from the circulation, back into the heart. So the heart is practically like a muscle with pumps inside it. Ability to pump out and also to receive. So this completion of the flowing out and the flowing back in through the various veins and various arteries makes the human system function excellently. And the heart beats thousands of times in a day. Hundreds of thousands of times in a day. To make the body function excellently. How great God is. God set in place such details in the functioning of our body. For us to be able to learn from these details. And because of the way the heart beats and the way the heart pumps out blood and receives blood. The heart is functioning well. Sustaining humans. And if something goes wrong with this structure that God has set in place. There will be need for an intervention of some form of diagnosis and maybe a surgeon. So if you can set in place structures in your life, the way the heart beats and pumps and causes effective running of the human system, you will realize that things will go on cruise control. Things will begin to flow on their own accord. By so doing, you can set different systems around your life that begins to flow out results by their own self until there is a structure. There can be a continuous flow. It is by virtue of setting in place structures that you can have a continuous flow in a home, in a marriage, in a business, in a ministry, in a life, in a relationship. So you need to seek to understand the different components that make up a process. Know how to put in place arrangements around those components, properly arranging them. Setting priorities. And thereafter, you begin to see things flowing on their own accord. When a structure of a piping system has been properly set in the home, there will be no need for fear when water is turned on. You know that it will flow through the piping system. And if there is any damage of any of the pipes, that particular damage must be traced and fixed. Until it is traced and fixed, you will realize that there will be wastage. When water flows through that, such a piping system, it will begin to flow out into the wrong quarters. Not into the right places. Into the wrong quarters. And that's why many times you have breakthroughs, you have visitations, and you are not able to keep it. Because it wastes. You are not able to build a proper altar around the visitation of the Lord. The Bible says, God visited Abraham in Genesis 12. And the Bible says, in response to the visitation of the Lord, Abraham built an altar there. And when Abraham journeyed, he came back to the same place where God had visited him. This time around, it was not God that initiated the visitation. Abraham called upon God at the same place of that altar. And God appeared and showed up again. The Lord is initiating it now with this teaching. He's bringing a word to you. As this word comes, receive it as an encounter, as a visitation of the Lord. And begin to respond by building an altar. By building a structure. By building a retaining receptacle. That will enable this visitation, this encounter, this word. Find a resting place. And so that by so doing, your results can become consistent and continuous. Can somebody say amen? Just to look at some more biblical examples. And also to look at benefits of structure. Structures are very important. Look at the book of Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 from verse 13. Luke chapter 9 from verse 13. But he said to them, this was Jesus talking, you give them something to eat. And they said, 
we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. This was when the Lord fed, you know, thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. Next verse, please. Next verse. You will find this very interesting. Just pay attention. For there were about 5,000 men at the place. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. Look at structure. Make them sit down in groups of 50. He didn't say, just queue up all of them anyhow. As I'm multiplying it, I'll be flinging it to them and everybody will get fed. It was going to cause a chaos. The Lord said, make them sit down in 50s. So, once somebody is delegated to a company of 50 and those 50 are sorted, you know, we know that those ones are out of, you know, those we need to attend to. Then we move to the next company of 50 and attend to them as well. And they did so according to the word of the Lord and made them all sit down. And what happens? Next verse, verse 16. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them not to the crowd, to the disciples. Then the disciples set this broken bread before the multitude. Look at structure again. The Lord didn't go directly to the people. He passed it through the disciples. Who then passed it to the people? The last verse, verse 17. Verse 17. So they all ate and were filled. And 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. There are a lot of lessons to learn from this. By virtue of the structure of the people sitting in 50s. And the Lord passing the bread and the fish through the disciples. We could see that they were able to count the number of people that came for the crusade. And that were fed. They were able to distribute without any form of disorderliness or chaos. They were able to recoup the leftover after they were through. Because from every company of 50s, they were able to gather back what was left over by virtue of this orderliness. And there was also multiplication of the bread flowing because of the structure that had been set in place. Anytime there is no proper structure set in place as, you know, as inspired by the Lord, a multiplication and a move usually ceases. Once a move begins of the Spirit... And you don't set structures to retain that flow and that visitation of the Lord. There will be a stench. There will be a cessation of that move. Because the Lord hates waste. Once there is no wine skin anymore, there will be a cessation. Look at the story in 2 Kings. 2 Kings 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. Look at that story from, from verse 1. You know, but we, we can just start from verse, verse 3. Let's start from verse 3. Of the widow who needed money to pay her a debt and went to meet the prophet. Then the prophet said to her, go borrow vessels from everywhere. That is to say, go set in place structures. Go build in place systems. Until the systems are set in place, there will be no multiplication. There will be no move and continuity of the move of the Spirit of God. Borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Borrow as many as you can. Continue creating structures. Continue creating receptacles. Continue creating systems. The next verse. And when you have come in, he says, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the ones that are full. Can you see that? The structure that you've set in place. Begin to pour. Begin to now flow the move of the Spirit. Begin to now flow the profits, the results through that structure. And everyone that is full, set them aside and bring the next one. And the next verse. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. Who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. She poured out the oil. And as she was pouring the oil, the oil did not finish. The oil kept multiplying. The oil kept flowing. Of course, that was a miracle of God. So this tells us that the miracle power, the miracle working power of God also works with the availability of structures. Once structures are finished, the move ceases. Every move of the Spirit flows on and lingers, is sustained by the availability of new wineskins, of men whose lives are consecrated to God, who have become structures that can retain such a move and that can sustain it until the point where they pass it on to the next generation. This is very critical. 
even in the coming revival and in sustaining moves of the Spirit. Structures have to be created. Men and women have to be discipled in our churches, in our fellowships, in our ministries. Men not only should come to the saving knowledge of the Lord, they must be built up and matured and trained in such a way that they can receive that move of the Spirit of God, grow with that move, sustain the move till they pass it on to the next generation. Now it came to pass, verse 6, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. It's as good as saying, as soon as there was no longer any new wineskin, no longer men that could receive and retain the move of God, that move stopped. That move stopped. As soon as everyone had been healed in the meeting, everyone had received from the Lord in the meeting, and people were no longer hungry for more of God, the move stopped. Because the Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What if everyone came into the meeting full? Then there is nothing for the Spirit of God to fill. If everybody came into the meeting full, wanting nothing, desiring nothing of the Lord, not wanting more of God, more of His power, more of His glory, more of His move in their midst, then there will be no move of the Spirit. We need to always create room and space for God's visitation, for God's power, for God's move. I would like us to quickly look at the scripture that is, you know, a little related, you know, to the previous passage we just read. It's in Mark 6. I just want you, to, want you to note a particular phrase that was used. Mark 6 verse 39. Just to quickly underscore that. Mark 6 39. It says, then Jesus, this is another account. This is the account of Mark concerning the feeding of the 5,000. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, this Mark's account gives more details. Look at what it says in the next verse. Next verse, please. Verse 40 of Mark 6. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Then he went out, verse 40, verse 40 of Mark 6. Thank you, Jesus. So they sat down in ranks. Notice this, in hundreds and in fifties. This particular account gives more description on the way they were able to set order in place among those thousands. Next verse. And when he had taken the five loaves on and on and on, he gave the five loaves to the disciples and the disciples gave it and distributed it among the people. Verse 42. Verse 42. So they all ate and were filled. You've noticed what I'm trying to show you there. They sat down in ranks. They were grouped in fifties and hundreds. So it's not limited to a particular way. It depends on what works within your own area, within your own system, within your own demography, within your own business, within your own family. What works after understanding all the, I mean, the relationships that exist among the components of the process, then you can now properly arrange the different parts in line with the way the system will work onto the production of consistent results. Can somebody say amen? Just one more example from scriptures. 1 Kings 18, from verse 30. 1 Kings 18, the account of Elijah on Mount Camel. 1 Kings 18, from verse 30. You will find this very interesting. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Next verse. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the Lord, the word of the Lord had come, come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Next verse. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Notice this. He first repaired the broken down altar. Are there broken down pipings in the system of your life? Are there broken down structures? In the way you do things. Have you allowed some form of, you know, looseness, lethargy, some form of indiscipline into your space, into your home, into your marriage? Is there some looseness in your life, in this area or in that area? Are there places you should have set proper boundaries, but you left it loose, unattended? The grass, I mean, grass and weeds have overgrown your, your field. And now you can't even separate between what is 
wheat and what is tear? Are there areas in your life that you've just left things loose? And because of that looseness, little foxes have been able to access your life, thereby spoiling the vine. You need to, first of all, repair every broken down altar. Repair every broken down structure. Repair every broken down system. And then begin to build again. The Bible says he built an altar with the stones in the name of the Lord. And made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seers of seed. He built an altar. Then he built a system that will ensure that there is a proper flow of what he was expecting. He was, he was preparing for the downpour of the fire of God. He was preparing for the fire of God to fall. So he didn't just, just you know, do things anyhow. He prepared a place, a landing pad for that fire to fall. Because if he just called down fire, he can begin to consume people that the fire was not intended. So he had to create a space for that fire to function within. And because he had an idea of the kind of fire he was expecting and that was going to come. Look at what he does next. Verse 33. Look at what he does next. Verse 33 of the same first Kings. And he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, laid it on the wood, and set few water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood, so that this water can at least sustain the fire coming, so that the fire will not spill over into the place it's not supposed to go. He set in place proper structure. Do you know it is the kind of track that are set, you know, for on a rail that enables trains to move? If those things are not set there, a train cannot move on tarred ground or flood ground or sandy ground. Those tracks have to be laid for a train to be able to move appropriately. It is the structure you put in place that the flow can glide upon. You have to be intentional in setting in place structure in your life so that the flow, the move, the visitation, the blessing of the Lord can find a resting place. Not only to rest, but also to be replicated, to be replenished, and to be sustained. Can somebody say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Some advantages of putting in place structures. I want you to just note these things. Very, very important advantages. Number one, structures enhance replication and reproduction. Structures enhance replication and reproduction. When you set in place structures, you are able to, to replicate results and reproduce results. Results won't just be one-off. Results won't just come by fluke. It won't just come by hook. It won't just come by stumbling into a blessing or a breakthrough. You knew how you got into this blessing. So you can do it again and again and again. Following the same principles that were applied previously. Structures enhance replication and reproduction. Number two. Structures, we've heard this earlier on, but just, you know, to itemize them. Structures minimizes wastes. Structures minimizes wastes. Structures remove biases and sentiments. Structures minimizes wastes. Structures remove biases and sentiments. Once there are structures, there will be no more bias. You will not function by sentiments. There is a structure. There is a way things run. There is a quality process flow for things to run. And once those things are observed, you are able to predict results. Have you been to factories before where, you know, a, a particular kind of product is about to be produced 10,000 times? They create a template. They set it in a machine. And once they set that template in a machine and, you know, a template has been properly created, this machine just reproduces the same thing over and again. All that is needed to be done is to be sure that it passes quality control tests and then it can be sold. You can run your life this way. Begin to understand what produces results in different areas of your life and build a structure around it. And it will shock you how life can become so full of results and continuous progress. Number three. Number three. It enhances sustenance and preservation of results. It enhances sustenance and preservation of results. It enhances sustenance and preservation of results. And the last one here. The last one here. Structures gives 
a basis for appraisal and improvement. Until there is a structure in place, you cannot appraise how far you have gone. The structure should have already defined what you set out to achieve. So that by the time you want to review, you can now check, parry, pursue what you had set as the objective. Did you achieve it? What was the shortfall? Did you overshoot it? What did you do that made you overshoot it? And then you can appraise properly. And then in the next episode or in the next season, you can now determine whether to restructure or to improve on your structure. Structure enables you to have a basis for appraisal, reappraisal, and improvement. As I begin to bring this to a close, I'd like you to just quickly see structure in different areas of the scriptures and how you can apply them in your life. You know, in John, John 18, I would like to start with John 18 verse 2. Some spiritual structures and church structures that can help you, just a few of them, just to jumpstart, you know, you on this, on this uh, path. John 18 verse 2. John 18 verse 2 says, And Judas, who betrayed him, talking about the Lord Jesus, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. He often met there with his disciples. There was a particular place Jesus met with his disciples. Jesus was predictable in some very, very basic things. The Bible says, He will rise up a great while before day, Mark 1, and go to a distant place to go pray. He often met in a particular place with his disciples. So there was a structure around their meeting place. So it wasn't difficult for them, all the disciples, to rally there and to have meeting from time to time. And you know what? This is important in running a church. There ought to be structures around meeting times, not just the general meeting times, meetings in the leadership, meetings in the workforce, meetings in the you know, strat strategy, um, strategy uh, committee, and all other forms of you know, ad hoc committees. A meeting place. And, you know, some form of, you know, um, memo that will be shared both before the meeting and also minutes of the meeting. The next thing I want you to see, the next thing I want you to see is about Paul. Paul also had structure in his life. John, Acts 17 verse 2. Acts 17 verse 2. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, the one, the one we read earlier on how to do with meetings, this has to do with Paul's consistent and continuous habit of sharing the word, teaching the word, and engaging people to understand the word as his custom was. He had a custom of constantly sharing the gospel with people. No, little wonder, he did so much exploits in the kingdom of God. He had a custom of regularly reasoning scriptures with people to bring them to, you know, a higher knowledge of God's word and of God's purpose. The next one is, has to do with the church. Hebrews 10, 25. Hebrews 10, 25. We've seen something that has to do with meeting. We've seen something that has to do with a person's passion for souls, a person's passion for maturing the body of Christ. Now, this has to do with people who are in the habit of missing meetings. Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Some people had a discipline, a structure around missing meetings, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Paul was admonishing us here to exhort saints not to miss meetings, because some of those meetings... The Lord has ordained to touch or reach a particular person. I remember a story, true life story, of a dear lady who had been consistent in attending a certain church. She was even a worker in the church. But there came a day which was the day of her visitation. And on that particular day, she had planned to come, but something distracted her. And guess what? As the service was progressing, suddenly the Spirit of God took over the service. And the minister of God, who was the guest minister that was ministering, you know, his eyes were open and he began to see angels ministering to people all over the congregation. Angels were delivering things to people, were operating on people, people were getting healed, pains were dissolving, growth were, you know, dematerializing. Phenomenal things were happening in the meeting. But the minister of God saw a particular angel. The angel did nothing. The angel just stood at a particular seat. The angel just stood there doing nothing. 
seemed like the angel was waiting for something. The man tried to give instructions, but the angel didn't move at any instruction. Every time the man gave instructions, other angels would move around, carry out things. But this particular angel just stood still. And it was, it was a big bother for this man. So after the service, the man, you know, began to pry into this, asking the Lord. And then he had a witness in the spirit that the angel had actually come for a particular person and the person was absent in church. So the man of God took it up with the, 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 the host ministers and asked them that I just, this, this was what happened during service. There was a particular angel who did nothing, just stood at a particular seat, seemed to be waiting for someone. And then as they went back and forth in the conversation, they came to the point where they discovered that there was a particular woman whose regular seat was the place that the angel was standing and the woman was missing in church on that day. Because, you know what, it's very important to make it habitual, to go to the place of worship of the Lord. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Don't let missing church meetings, especially in your local assembly, become a habit for you. It's a structure you can set in place and walk into your weekly and daily activities. The Lord grant you understanding in Jesus' name. Daniel 6 verse 10. This is also very interesting where prayer is concerned. Daniel 6 verse 10. The Bible says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. This was a custom for Daniel. He was in the you know, habit of Praying to God three times daily, seeking the Lord and the laws of the land, the, the, you know, the promulgations of decrees, the edicts, whatever they are of the land, the policies of the land are not going to stop him from seeking his Lord. It had become a custom for him. And this same secret place was what rescued Daniel from every trouble. And Daniel served in four generations under four regimes in the land of Babylon. And excelled through and through. And I dare say, this secret place was the place of Daniel's power. Was the place where he won all the battles. I'd like you to know today, saints of God. When you set in place structure in your life, you are preparing yourself for multiplication. You are preparing yourself for a phenomenal life that is filled with consistent results. You are preparing yourself to live a life with cruise control, yet producing results regularly. Just one more scripture as we round off this beautiful day. Hebrews 4.11. Hebrews 4.11. Very powerful scripture. This will set you, set you sailing right away. Hebrews 4.11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. A version says, labor to enter that rest. So what you need to do is put in place your diligence, labor to set in place those structures that will bring you to a place of rest. And thereafter, the results will begin to replicate themselves. Can somebody bow their heads and begin to talk to the Lord? Father, grace to be diligent, to enter into your rest where structures are concerned. Grant unto me in the name of the Lord Jesus. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Lord, I'm rising from here to go repair every damage, every broken down structure in my life. I'm rising to go repair every broken down piping system. That my results may become consistent. That my worship may rise to you on a regular basis. I won't be that Christian that visits once in a while when I am pressed with needs. I'm pressed with the pressures of life. I will be a worshiper of the Lord who seeks the Lord on a daily basis. Labor, the word of God says, to enter into that rest. Begin to bring your prayers to a close. Father, we bless your name. We thank you and we give you glory and praise for your word that has come to us at such a time as this. We receive grace today to not only labor to enter into rest, but to be detailed in seeking out areas where the structures have been broken down that repairs may be brought to them in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare every wounded soul, every wounded heart, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord grants you strength. To rise up in wholeness and to begin to be diligent to put in place structures and systems that make for continuous results. Thank you, mighty Father. 
that in our lives, in our homes, in our relationships and marriages, in our families, in our businesses, in career and in church, we'll begin to experience consistent results by virtue of divine structure. Thank you, mighty Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. God bless you.